Welcome everyone. Uh, we hope you all are staying at home and staying safe. My name is Gayatri Manu. I'm the program associate at Science Gallery Bengaluru. And welcome to our first digital exhibition season, Contagion, which explores the phenomena of transmission of behaviors, ideas, and diseases. I'm very delighted to introduce you both to T. Jayashree and Vikram Doctor. Uh, they will be speaking about Jayashree's film, A Human Question. Tracing the story of the global struggle to make HIV AIDS drugs more affordable and available, a human question raises key questions of whether private ownership of knowledge can be at the cost of human life. The film explores the complex world of patents, HIV AIDS medicines by connecting and contrasting personal narratives with those of international lobbyists and activists. We have with us the filmmaker of A Human Question, T. Jayashree. She has written and produced and directed for international television, radio, feature films, and independent documentaries for over two decades. Her award-winning work focuses on the intersection between gender, sexuality, law, and public health. Her films are widely screened around the globe and can be viewed at her Vimeo account. Kamra is an initiative grown out of her vast collection of raw footage on queer life and the queer movement in India. We also have with us Vikram Doctor, who's going to be conversing with Jayashree about a human question. Vikram Doctor is a Goa-based journalist who has worked with publications like the Times of India and Economic Times for over 20 years. He was also involved with the Gay Bombay Community Support Group and also with helping and documenting the 18-year campaign to decriminalize homosexuality in India. He has written on issues relating to material culture and social change in India, including the effects of epidemics like HIV and COVID-19. In case you missed watching the film before joining us for this discussion, I would like to encourage you all to watch the film on our exhibition website. All the films will be available until 13th June. Now I'm going to pass over the mic to uh, Jayashree and Bikram. I would remind you all to put your questions in the chat box because we will have a Q&A session after this. Once you've put your questions in the chat box, we will pass them on to uh, Jayashree and Bikram during the Q&A session. Over to you both. Okay, uh, the, thanks very much uh, Science Gallery for uh, inviting me to do this. I mean, uh, this is a conversation that I'm really, you know, I, I really am happy to have because Every time I open the newspaper every day today, um, I see something about, you know, the, the progress of COVID, about vaccine issues, about issues related to masking and responsibility and so many issues that just bring me back, remind me of all the issues that were debated in all the years of the HIV crisis. I mean, Jeshi, don't you agree? For, for yeah. those of us who have had some involvement with HIV, this last year and a half has been massive deja vu again and again and again. Yeah, very true, very true. The only difference is now it's, it's all over. It affects all of us. Yeah. At that yeah. time, it was just a select group. So, uh, you know, the larger society tried to ignore it and not really engage with it as they should have. And, uh, and in terms of uh, familiarity, it's the, the whole, I, I know this thing about social distancing, isolation. For me, isolation was one of the biggest, uh, you know, uh, deja vu moment in the sense that, you know, people were in, uh, infected with HIV, were all isolated initially, right. put away. And that's what we saw in the first wave of COVID too. Hmm? Uh, yeah, but I know. I mean, uh, I mean yeah. I'm, 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 I'm in Goa at the moment. And as you'll remember, I mean, Goa was where the first case we had, uh, the, 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 the Dominic case, you know, mm -hmm. where actually a young, a young man who was diagnosed as HIV positive was actually arrested under an, a really old Portuguese era law. And, 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 and pretty much he was, he, was, he, was, he was not put in a prison, but he was put in, an, in, an, in a sanatorium, uh, you know, mm -hmm. entirely isolated by himself. And that sort of like shunning, that sort of fear, you have a few narratives like that in, in, in the film. I mean, there's that one story of, of the uh, of the lady uh, whose husband uh, 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 died of HIV and then uh, his family threw her out. I mean that we saw again all that fear in the in the early years in the early uh, months of, uh, of, of 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 COVID. Um, I mean the the one difference actually, and it's a sort of bittersweet difference, is uh, throughout the HIV in the throughout the early years of HIV. 
uh, one of the biggest challenges for activists was forcing companies and governments to take the issue seriously and to push companies to develop the, 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 the drugs. I mean, what this last one year has shown us, I think, is that it can be done. I mean, medical knowledge, uh, you know, the, the uh, scientific achievements, uh, uh, despite all the manifest failures uh, in, in, in coming to terms with COVID, the fact is that faced with an unprecedented challenge, within a year and a half, vaccines have been developed, vaccines have been produced, not adequately, but on an incredible scale, and vaccines are being given out, again, not anywhere near adequately, and yet, in a way, if we keep in mind that these vaccines did not even exist two years ago, it's, it's been amazing. And part of me thinks, and I'm sure you agree, that imagine if this urgency and this speed had happened with, with, with HIV, all the thousands of people who would still be alive today. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I, this film was made 15 years ago, almost 16 yeah. years ago, and I was watching it again in this process of this exhibition. And what really struck me was the ending of the film, where Dr. James Love talks about, you know, we have to rethink the way uh, civil society engages with science and science and society, and where are we going, and what kind of uh, future we want. And you know, it it sounded very positive at that time, and we we ended the film with that because we wanted to end it also in a, in a positive note. Yeah. And, and there were so many voices at that time from all over the world talking about this whole access to affordable medicine, even though we talked about HIV, it was also about the larger medicines, you know, all yeah. other ailments. And then I saw that this again this morning and I was thinking, but you know, 15 years later, we still haven't reached that stage. What is our, our, our connection with science and the larger society? And is it equitable? We, we are again talking about the same, same question, same issues, you know, uh, in terms of access, because the, right now the vaccine access is, a, is in jeopardy, right? Yes. So it just, you know, it's kind of, um, you know, we and haven't really it, gone that far, I feel. Yeah. And there are so many other issues, which again, you know, watching your film brings this up. I mean, for instance, uh, again, for the last two weeks, I mean, uh, the media has been full of stories of what have been called COVID orphans, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, kids who both of whose parents have, uh, have, have passed away due to, during to, uh, due to COVID. And again, this was an issue. We had HIV orphans, uh, so all these kids, and in, 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 a, in a way, it was, it was worse because usually these kids whose parents died of HIV, the kids were usually positive uh, uh, th themselves. So again, that was, that was a whole issue uh, uh, that, that had to be uh, dealt with at, at that time. I mean, you're see, and, and ironically, we are still even seeing some of the same faces. Uh, Dr. Fossey, uh, you know, who uh, played a am somewhat ambiguous role during the HIV uh, uh, era. He was not always sympathetic, and many HIV activists became antagonistic towards him. Uh, today, he is the great sage of COVID, and, and very rightly. And to me, actually, that actually says something important, that uh, people can change, uh, ideas can change, views can change. And I think the only thing when one is faced with such a life-changing event as an epidemic like, a like HIV or a pandemic like COVID is that we cannot afford to be rigid about anything. Yeah. We have to be willing to change and accept almost anything, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, to to link it, link it back to the film, when I yeah. when I started uh, with this wanting to make this film, was the 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 idea was that you know people were moving to the west, especially to Germany and Sweden, because they couldn't find uh, medicine in their own countries, right? Exactly. Uh, and uh, now in this situation, where do we go? It's affecting all over the world, right? I mean, the exactly people who, the same issues happening. We're having yeah. all these stories of people who are doing vaccine tourism, tourism I think, yes. like you know, yes. who are going abroad to get like uh, vaccinated. And uh, one of the, the the difficult issues in your film is people who are who are uh, uh, traveling to the west uh, sometimes as refugees under in incredible situ and horrific situations. Simply, as somebody says in the in the in the film, simply because they want to live. Yeah, and the question is, what kind of life? What what, what kind what of, of, life, of yeah. what, quality what, of your what, life and yeah. of that? So I mean, but I, I want yeah. to start, you know before we, mm -hmm. we get in like this. Mm -hmm. How did you come to make this film? 
I mean, you're, you're, you've been so deeply involved. I've known you over these years with your deep involvement with sexuality issues with HIV. I've never actually asked you how you got involved in this. So um, to track back, you know, I started um, training to make films, videos for development on development issues in the 90s, early 90s, which was a time where a lot of uh, projects around reproductive health was happening in India. Uh, there was uh, there was campaign on the Zipa Pravera and injectable, um, you know, contraceptives and all of that. So I was kind of part of those um, those projects as a young assistant uh, filmmaker kind of thing. And then uh, slowly, it was also the HIV time, right? The mid 90s, where there were a lot of uh, projects on HIV outreach and mostly targeting sex workers in Bombay. Uh, so I was part of one or two uh, project film projects on uh, researching for these projects. That kind of gave me a kind of an insight to what was happening. And I was still very young. And these were all films that are made by NGOs for advocacy and all of that but we never really uh, went beyond uh, what the project was right you talk to 20 sex workers and then you talk about how many condoms have been distributed and why condoms are not being distributed and those were the issues those time those days and and uh, there wasn't any talk about you know treatment or is there a treatment for HIV infected people? What do we do? The only thing that they talked about was the mother to child transmission which kind of took off in a in a uh, quite a strong way. Uh, then later on in, in the 2000s, when I started making my own independent projects um, and I got involved in the sexuality issues, I didn't get involved in the sexuality issues as a filmmaker, actually as a friend and, and somebody who was hanging out with this group. Uh, and HIV and sexuality uh, is very, very intertwined. You know that you've written about it. So, uh, so they, that kind of gave me an, a kind of a glimpse into what's going on in their lives. And, People didn't talk about being infected with HIV. People still don't talk about it very openly unless you are intimate with the person you wouldn't know it, know about it. And, and uh, I'm, I'm seeing all the parallels with people who just don't want to talk about the fact that, that they have COVID. They're like, oh, yes, le yes. you know, let me keep it quiet. Maybe I'll just yes. get, get over it at home. And, you know, I don't want the neighbors to know because then, you know, so again, we're seeing these Same, issues. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's going on. So then in 2002, uh, you know, there's this novel that came out called A Constant Gardener, written right. by uh, John Lecker. Yeah. yeah, and he was to write about Cold War and spy novels and right. by early 2000 he said you know now the, the there is no soviet union so there's not going to be this kind of cold war but there's going to yeah. be a different kind of war which would right. be mostly with the corporate world and it would right. be for essential uh, you know ingredients that human beings need like health water those are the things that he talked about and his first novel exploring this was constant gardening yeah. which talked about clinical trials in africa and uh, pharmaceutical drugs and access to it and all of that and for this novel he actually researched with a very small ngo called uh, bukopharma campaign in bielefeld germany and uh, they then became the co-producers of this film uh, and uh, and and John Lecard has actually um, you know has a character in his novel which is based on Bupu and, wow. and a friend of mine was is a doctor who worked there. So what Bupu does and uh, is that they're a very tiny organization, but they uh, actually monitor pharmaceutical drugs and companies, and they figure out like who's producing what and which product is being sold where. A lot of banned pharmaceutical drugs in the West is actually freely available in India even today, over the counter. You can just go and buy those so-called vitamin syrups. They're actually banned, and uh, but it's it's available here. So this is what this group was doing. And then when this novel came, uh, this friend of mine, Christiana Fisher, who's a doctor there, and she got very excited. And she's been work, doing a lot of work with uh, the tribals in India and all of that. And so she wanted to do something. And she she said, you know, there are all these people who are coming from Africa and Latin America and seeking asylum in this country because they don't have health care in there and they don't have access to HIV drugs. Um, so she said, can we do something about you know, look at women with HIV in India and women here. And for me, um, you know, that kind of comparison wasn't very exciting. And so I started meeting who are these people, because for me, the most exciting thing is how can a disease become a, a, a provision for seeking political asylum? Because they would come under political asylum there. Right. So I started meeting all these small NGOs in Germany and trying to also understand um, how access to medicine as uh, HIV medicine has happened to the, um, the common population in Western countries. So the, Germany was kind of forefront in that. And Germany also produces, it has many pharmaceutical companies there. 
So I started looking at this and started talking to different people and they all kept saying, oh, you're coming from India and there's going to be this change in the patent law and it's going to affect all of us. And there wasn't hardly any talk about it, about that in India. This was in 2003. So suddenly, like, you know, um, there were all these small groups started talking about it. And in India, it was mostly the lawyers were talking about it. Lawyers Collective was very involved in it and uh, Alternative Law Forum. And then there was other small groups that came up and then uh, and there was, they were mostly based in Delhi. And uh, I started talking to them to understand what this is. And very quickly realized that it's actually is being pushed under trade. You know, this whole thing about healthcare is becoming, because pharmaceutical drugs are for trade product, I mean, you're selling, buying and all of that. And uh, we then tried to change our law. So then that became a focal point for me then. I wanted to tell the story of people uh, with the backdrop of this uh, this change in, in the patent law, because it also suddenly became very global. Everybody's eyes were on India and, and HIV kind of brought all of these people together in this very global scale. Uh, even though, uh, you know, a lot of the um, activists in India felt that you know, by then HIV has had a lot of funding in India, there was all the kind of politics going on. But treatment still wasn't a big issue in India. And that's why I focused on that very small group in Bangalore, Milana, where there's only this one woman, Chandrika, who was talking about, about medicine because she found a private sponsor who still sponsors her and her son. And her son, that boy you saw in the film, is now 22 years old and he's oh. in third line medication and he's still alive, he's working. Oh. And, uh, and, and this one person who is just held their hands throughout you know and and that's something I feel is uh is uh, doesn't happen to everyone and therefore Chandrika also felt she should talk about it and also this small group of women they don't they didn't fall under any of the government thing because right. these are all widows and right. they were not married to truck drivers or right. you know, all of those right. so it was also good to I mean I felt like here was this person who was talking about this even though it's a small part of it in the film but that kind of brought together this this whole issue in front but I also feel that at that time it was a very complicated issue and a lot of right. people still weren't talking about treatment yeah. in that sense in India. Right. Yeah. I mean uh, one of the things that comes through in your film and uh, as, you say, as you say people like Chandrika bring it out there's that in the initial stages of an epidemic or a pandemic, there's a sort of uh, tendency to, to moralize. And you say, you know, the, to, to, to blame the people who fall sick. I mean, they're saying, you know, you, you are like this, therefore, that's why you're falling, you're falling sick. And in the early years of HIV, we saw this obviously happening with gay people, with drug users, uh, with sex workers. Uh, there's always this sort of this sense of that. Well, you deserved it. I mean, that's that's what you what you get. And time and again, it was people like Chandrika or the lady in Germany, whose name is also in the film, whose name I forget. Uh, you know, who pushed back and saying that you know we don't fall under these categories. We got it, and this sort of finger pointing is pointless. And again, over here in the early stages of, of COVID, you know, it was, we got, you got all these random explanations, you know, you eat non-vegetarian food, that's why you, you, you got it. You know, you, you are decadent Western people, that's why you got it. I mean, our, in, our own government has been so moralizing about it. And in all the moralizing, they failed to, to do the, their own planning. And now we are seeing the disaster that is unfolding uh, 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 around us. So, I think this is one of the themes in your film, right? That yeah. this sort of moralizing and division is completely pointless. Yeah, and, and the fear, the fear that, you know, uh, fear of not wanting to understand yeah. and fear that we'll get it. And also this thing that, oh, it's not us. This is Shut not up. going to happen. Even with COVID, I saw right. early on that, oh, this is not going to you know, affect us. You know, it's all happening in the West. You know, people are dying in Spain and Italy right. and China, not not here, you know, this will not happen. And this has always been around with us, you know, this thing of othering. And, and that's how we, we kind of, you know, go on with our lives. Yeah. So, I mean, that's not very um, positive in the sense that it doesn't really help us in the, in the long run. And COVID has really shown that because COVID, COVID is crippling all forms of life, right? Because uh, viruses don't care. No, I mean, you know, you know, they, they don't differentiate. I mean, mm -hmm. in a sense, they are the most egalitarian things. I mean, and sometimes you don't know. I mean, you know, some people have just recovered from COVID without any problems. Old people have recovered from COVID mm -hmm. without any problems. Young people 
have had huge problems. I mean, they, 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 it seems like there is really no saying. I mean, the, the, the viruses are, uh, you know, we, we, cannot, we, we, can't, we can't tell uh, how the viruses work. The other person in your who you have in your film, again, with whom I'm seeing a parallel with someone in COVID is you have Dr. Hamid uh, <laughs> of CIPLA. And CIPLA and uh, to some extent other Indian, uh, Indian pharma manufacturers played a very interesting role in HIV. And again, we're seeing uh, uh, you know, the Punawalas uh, and, and Serum Institute of, of India playing an interesting role. Like, can you just tell us a little bit about the, odd, the, the interesting role that Indian pharma played and what you feel about the, their role in, in, the HIV, in, in HIV? Yeah, so, um, so we, we changed our patent law in the 1970s huh? uh, to say that, you know, uh, that we should develop our own generic pharmaceutical industry and that we make uh, medicines available, uh, you know, cheaper and also free where is possible. And, and that's how this whole industry actually mushroomed. We have a very robust pharmaceutical industry. And because of this change in the patent law in the 70s from uh, being, uh, uh, so the, the thing is that CIPLA, a uh, company like CIPLA has a long history, right? They've been part of the independent movement and the change in India and all of that. And Mr. Hamid actually uh, is very, very caring person. And he says that, you know, it depends on how much profit you want to make. You will make profit anyway, you know, because this is such an important thing. You will make profit. So do you want to make enough profit? You want to make obscene profit? What is it? And, and these guys are very, very good at making these drugs and making it available. So, right. so, and they used that whole provision of compulsory licensing, right? right? And, and so they were, they were uh, actually sending medicines to Africa and even in the West, you know, uh, this is what I found out uh, that even in the US and Europe, you are under that, uh, whatever their health insurance is, the first uh, uh, medicine that a doctor has to prescribe is a generic medicine, not the branded right. medicine. Right right, right, right. So, and where are those generics coming from? It's coming from right. places like yeah. India, Mexico, Absolutely. you know, Thailand, Brazil, kind of places. And but what happened with HIV medication is that it is so expensive. It is uh, so they just and, and it's true of cancer drugs. No one really talks about cancer medicines. Actually, it's much more expensive. And uh, and so when that whole two thousand two struggle happened in South Africa, when they said like you know how can these pharmaceutical companies sell for such an outrageous price when these uh, generic companies can produce it for like one tenth of the cost. And that's what Supla showed that they can and they can distribute it. And you do need international agencies to distribute these things like, for example, WHO and all of these other organizations, health organizations. And that's also the reason why they all rallied around together, you know, the activist groups and even a pharmaceutical company like Cipla joined hands and could say that, no, we have to make these medicines available to people so people don't die. At the same time, what was happening, which I, it's my personal take, which is why the HIV movement didn't take off as much as like, say, what ACT UP and all did in, in the US is that at that time, the HIV, uh, the ART drugs were still cheap for the middle class and upper middle class in India. It was like a thousand rupees, twelve hundred rupees for a month. So people could could afford, but not people like Chandrika, because uh, the ART is also along with ART. You have to also have good nutritious food and all of those things, uh, which you know if you live in poverty, you can't really do that. So that was affecting. So there was a whole invisible group of people who were using ARTs who can afford to have it, but they were not willing to come out and talk about it. Right. And that was one of the reasons why the treatment movement didn't really take off in that large scale. But coming back to CIPLA and, and, and other pharmaceutical companies that we, we were always producing for, for the rest of the world. And in fact, when I, uh, when I went to interview the WTO ambassador from India, I didn't use that footage in the film. He told me, he said, uh, you know, we are not worried about pharmaceuticals. Uh, this was in 2004. And he said, we are more worried about the agriculture sector, that we don't want any FDAs coming into, uh, uh, you know, any foreign trade agreement coming into uh, agriculture, but we, we we don't we don't mind about pharmaceuticals because they are very robust and they will they will continue. And 15 years later, we are seeing you know we are losing the agriculture sector as well. Right. But uh, but because from in the pharmaceuticals there were companies like Cipla which were you know they were the gatekeepers of conscience right. They were trying to 
actually uh, sell, make these, produce these drugs uh, for fair price. But there was also a simultaneous campaign that was going on saying these generic drugs are not good. They are spurious. Right. Uh, in fact, there was a lot of articles written around that time saying that, you know, these generic drugs are not, not good and we should not be taking these things and only branded drugs. And it was, of course, fed by the international farmers. So there was also always this competition because these people are also now selling drugs in the in the free market, right? So, right. so there is that competition going on, and so so coming to the what is happening now again, it's the the thing is that yes, the the way the scientific research has gone on and all these vaccines have come in so quickly, uh, we should have actually encouraged also these companies that already exist in manufacturing. So that's where we are seeing this this big uh, backlog, right? And there was always stockpiling of of medications by all of these these countries. It's not something you knew, you know. Right. There was another drug that came soon after. I think it was around two thousand eight, two thousand nine, for hepatitis C, which is yeah. actually very yeah. very expensive. Supposed to, be, supposed to be weird, yeah, yes. And 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 they are very cheap in India. Yeah. And yeah. I know people who ask me, can you send some for me, you know? Uh, so, oh yeah, it's called hepatitis uh, tourism. I mean, like people have, have, have come here. And I mean, the, the difference with that drug, unlike with HIV, is that HIV, you have to take it for life. With, yeah. So first we uh, it's I think it's a three-month course, and then you're completely uh, uh, cured. So I know people who have come here and, uh, and, and, and done the whole course of treatment uh, in India. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, that, that's one of the reasons why nobody uh, also really engaged with this whole thing of, uh, you know, uh, this IP thing. And they could keep on saying that, you know, if we have, uh, you know, there will be no innovation happening. Right. Uh, but, you know, for medicines, it's different. You know? See, innovation has happened you know, when everybody came together for COVID vaccine. Yeah, absolutely. I, no, absolutely. So, so, so I, I, and as I said, as I started off by saying, I mean, uh, to me, the the what the, the way the 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 uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, industry, I mean, the companies, uh, the uh, you know, the medical researchers uh, came together and produced uh, these uh, vaccines, multiple vaccines, uh, within a year, um, is really is really incredible. I mean, it's testament to what might have been possible if. HIV had been taken as seriously as 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 COVID is uh, is being taken, and uh, I, I I wouldn't say you know in that uh, uh, that all those battles over trips uh, and 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 patent access were uh, went in vain. I mean, certain battles were lost. I mean, uh, uh, but I mean the idea of compulsory licensing survived, and we are seeing it happening today. I mean. Uh, just a couple of weeks back, President Biden has has said that the U.S. is considering uh, supporting uh, opening out the patents for the vaccines. Now, that to me is incredible. Uh, the uh, you know it, the, that was exactly what the U.S. fought. U.S. government fought tooth and nail against yeah. uh, for HIV drugs, and now a U.S. president is saying that he's willing to consider it. Uh, for 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 uh, for the uh, for COVID vaccines. Yeah. So in in one sense, I would say that that is one of the uh, you know one of the the, the the ways in which that all that that battle that activists like the ones that you show in your film fought over compulsory licensing. In a sense, this is their victory. Yeah. That they kept the idea the idea of compulsory licensing as an option. Uh, not an adequate option. I mean, it's 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 so much more could be done. But at least. The possibility, uh, mm. the, to me, that that is really remarkable. Yeah, and and they are continuing to, you know, that they have to actually monitor each and every patent application, yeah. and 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 this whole thing of evergreening process. I mean, they have to counter it all the time. And I keep reading about it, and I and and it's a very dry, difficult paperwork. So not, it's not easy for you know activists to get into it in that sense but there is a bunch of people who are, who are still doing it and and i what i hear is that it's not uh, you know the patent office doesn't really use it all, all the time and right. these people have to keep nudging it you know and and you can see that in the last 10 years a lot of the newer medicines have actually been quite expensive uh, from you know before so that the even uh, so 
it's not you know when you're sick you just go if you're about to pay you pay whatever you really don't think about these things and in that sense this pandemic and now this whole interface with the public health system and the hospitals in india i hope this will push these these uh, these issues forward and say why is it so expensive for us here? right right you know right, and uh, right. even if even if you are willing to pay you're not going to get this quality medical care that okay. you need okay. right so I, I i mean i keep trying to see that yeah i hope you know this 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 um, conversation goes moves forward and and you know uh, but but as you said yeah those activists are still at it gopak kumar and leena all of them are still there you know and still working on these things kajal vivek all of these people. right yeah. right right yeah. i mean i'm going to ask an uncomfortable question to yeah. uh, to some extent i'm going to play devil's advocate here um mm-hmm. and ask you what role you see ultimately for private pharma companies uh in in this whole question of of uh of vaccine or or medicine development and 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 access um it, 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 many of the activists like the ones you deal with in the film uh completely demonize the pharmaceutical industry uh, and in many cases understandably so i mean the the the, the sins of the pharmaceutical industry as john le carre pointed out very presciently in the, in the constant gardener are huge um and uh yes some sort of reckoning is needed but at the same time i think the last year and a half has shown the 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 strengths of the pharma industry i mean clearly the pharma industry is is going to come out of covid very well i mean uh, yeah, at, yeah. Least, at least at least uh, financially the sales prices are like uh, 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 booming um and but but, uh, but i'm not being cynical here i mean uh, the, uh, to me the fact that uh the vaccines were produced and 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 so many different vaccines so many new technologies the mrna M- technology uh and the fact that they were brought to market so so fast and the fact that a company like uh serum institute of india can actually look at supplying vaccines to the to the world to me it shows the dynamism of the private sector and since we are and i know that an argument was made at the time by many activists that medicine development should happen uh by the state sector and that, yes it's true that there are there are some countries cuba for example which also has its own which has developed its own covid vaccine um are examples of uh how state uh, how state development of pharma can happen on the other hand we we are currently in india seeing a complete collapse of the state of a state that that promised to be efficient that promised to deliver that promised so much and has completely failed it makes me dubious of trusting the state as an actor so i have no clear answer on this and i'm i'm sure many people don't but i still see a role uh, for the pharma sector uh in, in making in, in in producing and developing medicines and bringing vaccines and in making a profit a fair profit i mean but but i said what do you feel yeah see um let's not forget that all basic research for for any drug any pharmaceutical drug is uh, is done in public sector places like academic institutions around the world even in the us right but what us does very well which we don't is this whole which is a very catch phrase here is this public private partnership you know um we don't have that And, and and that's a good and that's a good thing i mean that, yeah, that's yeah, that's thing. what i'm saying yeah, so yeah. if if we could actually do that yes. uh and then it would you know uh it would work for the 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 problem with public health to a large extent also that in the uh, 2000s we also saw that uh, the delivery of of healthcare was also you no know, uh, the, the state actually abdicated it. there was one one level there was medical tourism uh, so they were making a lot of money and the other thing was given to ngos right? right and hiv that was a big thing that happened right we had the the foreign funding for hiv was so huge so vast in this country and and it went on for 10 years and it basically collapsed i mean the condoms were initially distributed by the department of family and uh, you know family welfare and the family health and welfare uh as part of family planning program then then when when the hiv uh, thing came and it was all uh, done through all these various foreign ngos and they said you know they brought in this whole idea of public or private partnership they said that you know people have to buy condoms for two rupees or something 
uh, and that, that actually fizzled out very fast. But what I'm trying to say is that, yes, we need private players. We need pharmaceutical industry. Uh, uh, ultimately, SIPLA is the one that stepped in for whether it was, uh, you know, anti-HIV uh, drug ARTs in Africa, South Africa, or in India, or cancer drugs in South Korea. They played a huge role in getting cancer medicines to South Korea at one point. So, um, so I think we do need them, but we need to have this dialogue. And I think that's where civil society comes in. We have to say that you cannot, you know, you need both players. You need to have everyone working together. But as you said, we are in a, in a state where all, all infrastructure has been dismantled. All of those institutions which could have provided this has been dismantled. So how do we, where do we go from here? And we're also seeing that this large uh, multinational corporations are also not doing anything. Yeah, and so I have not seen any statement coming out of any of those people yeah. since COVID uh, has started. Yes, the, the scientists of the world the doctors of the world all got together. They they developed this vaccine fine, but the biggest question is how are we going to reach it to the billions of people that we need, well, and which country will come out? You know, at the end of right. the day, you know. So I mean, I, I think some solutions are emerging. I mean, like just today, I just in fact while I was uh, just a couple last couple of hours, I think there's been an interesting announcement. Uh, I don't know if it's true that the Maharashtra government is now going to is now trying to uh, contract directly with Pfizer. To get to import a huge amount of Pfizer vaccines and uh, and, and start inoculating uh, people first in Bo Mumbai then the rest uh, rest of Maharashtra, which is again a sort of solution that would not have been thought about uh, earlier. So and I mean uh, since we need to uh, end uh, soon to us so that you know people can ask questions um, and I I mean even in in a time as bad as this I mean no one has to try and end on a slightly positive note. I have to look back. To, again to HIV and um, to look at what it sounds horrible to say this but the man the many good the many benefits that came out of HIV I mean again saying this is always loaded because you are making the statement on the dead bodies of the thousands of people and they're not faceless dead bodies the people that you and I know who have died of HIV mm -hmm. um, and so I'm so it seems presumptuous to say that something good could have come out of it. Yet the truth is something good did come out of HIV. Uh, uh, HIV forced uh, countries like India to look at the fact that there were people like homosexuals uh, in India and that they couldn't just, just pretend we didn't exist because, uh, because unfortunately HIV were, uh, were, were spreading through, you know, through the gay community and from the gay community towards uh, the larger community. And uh, you know, yes, there were all those people in the early years said, oh, just lock up all those gay people, etc. That's never going to be possible. It just, it just says it's not possible to lock, up, lock away all the, all the COVID-affected uh, people. And so, you know, the push to decriminalize homosexuality did start with, with, with HIV. Um, and uh, uh, the, the whole access to, the access to drugs campaigns, which you document in your films, as I said, the, the dialogue over compulsory licensing, you know, all these are the uh, are the fruits of the of of the HIV epidemic. I'm hopeful that some benefit will come from COVID. Yes. Will we? Will we? Are we now going to be forced to take to look at in India's incredible failure to look at healthcare at at the the, the lack of access to something as basic as oxygen um, at the at 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 the the, the sheer inadequacy of the support staff. Uh, all these incredible health healthcare workers, from the doctors and nurses to the just the people who are going out and 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 doing the sampling and uh, you know uh, and just all the people who are disposing, even the cremation workers, you know, mm -hmm. who are, who are historically such a despised community in India, who have been performing such incredible jobs in the last horror figures. Out of this horror of the last one month, is something good going to come? You know, in the beginning of COVID, I was very hopeful. I thought, okay, here's an opportunity for us to actually rethink and relook at the public health care system that we have in this country. It was a, it was a great opportunity that the state could have done so much. And people, uh, states like Kerala has done, I mean, they've done good stuff. And there are some small pockets in the country that have done really good stuff. And I thought this will you know, replicate and go across the country. But this second wave was really like, sometimes I feel, I mean, I am not at all hopeful, like what's going to happen. But on the other hand, it's the resilience of people. No, Again, it's the people who, as you mentioned, you, you, you 
you have a whole list of people that you, you you've called out and they are all the ones who are keeping keeping us going right now right yeah. so i i do hope something comes out of it i do hope but let's not forget this is the first time people across class yeah. are experiencing what dismal healthcare system we yeah. have in this country whether you're going to a private hospital or you're going to a government hospital yeah. what is it you know uh, so so i hope this will make people think about uh, you know what is the state of the situation and how can we can change it because when we make these kind of films i mean people will come watch the film they'll say yes yes and and then this all, this happens to this no bunch of people not to us but right now it's happening to all of us and underlying thing that we have is the prejudice and i hope we will let go of our prejudices in our life in our society at, by the end of this whole experience that we are all collectively going through i hope i so. I, i personally actually feel the second wave mm-hmm. will be better for this because even after the first wave we saw the complacency yeah. setting in when for whatever reason uh, india was spared the worst horrors in the in the in the, in the first wave we saw how easily people became compl- complacent we saw people giving all these random reasons oh you know we have natural immunity or that it's all uh, i mean people saying oh it's not affecting of course it was affecting people like people uh, you know lo- lower income people people uh, people in slums it was affecting and there was but people in middle class you know in the middle class in in their apartment complexes were like oh you know we we've dealt with covid and then of course the prime minister comes out and says we have conquered uh, covid and that complacency has been comprehensively you know shot to pieces by the by by the second wave and i hope that you know uh, this, this will this will this this lesson will remain to us that we don't uh, uh we, we that, that, that we cannot be complacent that we have to understand that the healthcare system is is incredibly is incredibly broken in some cases in many places was never built in the first place and that yes you know we may all have a connections we may all have people we can call we may all pride ourselves on our networks but it's but when yeah. something like this happens it all fails and yeah. i hope you know something good will come out of all this yeah. let's hope and and thank you thank you so much vikram yeah thank you jayshree for making the film and uh, and and uh, thank you guy three for in, for for inviting us um as i said you know contagions are world changing events and one can only hope that some good change comes out of it all um as i mentioned earlier this is a exclusive q and a session with the filmmaker so please do share your questions and put them in the q and a box so that we can share them uh, with jashree uh jashree i would just like to begin by asking you your film is uh, sort of looks at the treatment of patients who live with hiv aids on a global scale so it begins in indonesia then we move to germany and then we come back to india so why did you think that it was important to um uh, trace a global perspective on the subject rather than just looking at what happened in india um so yeah so the the as i was talking earlier with vikram about uh you know treatment uh, conversation around treatment for hiv uh patients only started uh, much later it was only in the 2000s when we were trying to amend our patent law that that there was a lot of focus on hiv that that came uh, hiv in india happened uh, because um, because of the global uh, gaze on us because we were sending hiv aids drugs to the other parts of the world and if india loses its process patent and in and product patent comes in all the other countries will also lose their generic cheap drugs so which is why it became a global uh, campaign and 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 everybody was in india trying to ad- advocate with with the parliament here and with the wto in geneva so hiv kind of becomes an an and kind of a you know an icon for for patent law and and for to access to um, affordable medicine but actually it was also about all other medications i want to tell you this that uh, the one of the things that we did negotiate when we uh, we amended the patent law was that newer drugs newer drugs that were made after 2004 uh which had to go through that new product patent uh, rather than the older drugs right 
So in the last 10 years, you would have seen a lot of the medicines are actually much more expensive than before. So it was HIV just, was just an example that I, I took, but the, the, the question was this, this larger question. And also we were all part of market economy by then. It was a liberalized India. And, and we can talk about anything what that's happening around the world, which influences your life. And one of the things that that really uh, struck us was that, you know, we can have a elected parliament here, but a lot of the negotiations are happening in multilateral forums like WTO and WIPO and all of these places. And yet uh, there is something else that goes on behind the scenes, which is the bilateral negotiations. So, you know, you give and take kind of stuff. So, so, you know, those are the things that interested me more than anything else when I was making this film. And you needed a human interest angle story. And, and it, was, it was true that, that, you know, the HIV patients were the forefront of, of this whole saga. And, and that, that's why I, I focused. And then I traveled through these countries and I just didn't want to talk about only India. And also at that time, there were not many um, HIV infected people in India were talking about either their status or wanting treatment at that point. Mm -hmm. So Jayashree, this is something that we spoke about post your discussion with uh, Vikram as well, about what would you do differently if you made the film in 2021? The film was made in 2006 and it's been nearly 15 years since it was released. Obviously, there would be a there would be a few technical changes you might make. Not that I'm suggesting that the film needs any, but um, in terms of the subjects that you follow, or um, you know, the kind of interviews that you did, uh, what, and also the the times that we're living in currently, um, how would you go about it if you had made the film now? Made the film about treatment, about about or the access to. See, my film is actually about, not really about HIV, it's about global access to affordable medicine. And this is what we are living through right now. We are trying to get affordable access to COVID vaccines, right? So we are in this position now. But if you really, uh, see, I, I kept thinking about updating this film because this is 15 years old. A lot of things had happened since then. Uh, but somewhere I didn't update it. And I, I feel uh, glad about it because it's, there's so much parallels now. We can see from what happened then. Uh, the, one of the things that, that in the last 10 years that has happened and it actually crippled many, many, many uh, families in India is the cancer treatment. You know, so so a lot of that. So if you talk, so I would talk more larger canvas of affordable medicine now. If I had to talk about, and of course now with COVID, who knows, who knows how it would all pan out. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so and, we have. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Jayashree, continue. No, I, I mean, this thing about technical stuff. These are all. I mean, this kind of filmmaking requires a lot of time. And uh, you need to interact with people. I spent four years with most of the people who are in my film, talking to them, getting to know them and all of that. So, I mean, with COVID, that kind of filmmaking, I mean, I've been stuck at home for like nearly a year and a half now. So that, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, we have to imagine in different ways if you want to make those kind of films, yeah. Uh, so we have a question from uh, one of the attendees and they want to know what your sort of, motivation behind making the film was and what you sort of expected after after having people watch the film what did you think what was the intended sort of impact of the film hmm. so yeah so when i uh, as i discussed earlier with vikram and i talked about how this film came about uh, so when i was making the film for me it was very clear that that I wanted to talk about these complexities between, I mean, uh, the law and health and people's lives, right? And um, and it's a difficult film. It's a very complex film. It doesn't have like the straight single narrative, you know. And um, so it is hard film to to see. And I feel to some extent it was made much earlier than its time because at that time, you know, there was also like there was. You know, there's another whole um, area of you know the the politics around HIV and the funding around HIV. So a lot of people like didn't want to engage with HIV because the, 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 there was a lot of HIV work in India happening at that time. So 
but or people said um, we want to see more of the patients why should we talk about these things trips and you know compulsory licensing these are very difficult dry subject so why should we engage with this but when i had this very smaller screenings with um, people who were engaged with public health or law or people who were generally talking about human rights uh, there was a lot of interest and there were a lot of discussion and the film doesn't give you any solution it just tells you what is going on right and why we need to come together and we need to be vigilant about what's happening around us um so so it it had its very slow progress i mean it wasn't like a blockbuster documentary or any of those things but you know wherever whenever i've screened it there has been a lot of very engaging discussion that i've had and to some extent i feel that's very satisfying to me for having put in that effort people do uh, respond to it and i must say it's very beautifully shot and edited i i must thank my crew like both mukul kishore who did the camera work and uh, rikav desai who actually edited it so beautifully because something it's very dry when he started editing it it was very difficult film like how do we tell this story in this very smooth nice way and engaging way so which he he actually helped craft that uh, the the film in that way mm, so i feel that uh, i you know it has happened in small pockets it has worked and uh, i feel now again there is a lot of um, you know uh, we can use this film again because it's, it, there's so much parallel right now with what's going on so if anybody wants to understand about the international politics around access to medicine yes you can you know watch this film and see uh, what was the other question you asked what was the hmm, so it was uh, i yes. was just asking you what the intended impact was and i think you answered yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. so i can see that urvashi uh, menon has her hand raised i'm just going to unmute her and urvashi would you like to ask your question to jashi now i actually uh, forgot that i could ask questions on that sorry i'll lower my hand okay um we have another question in the chat um do you did mention that uh, and this is me this is not the person who's asking do you did mention that the film is more about global access to medicines rather than hiv but this attendee wants to know do you have a personal connection or reason for thinking about or making a film about hiv um so i had earlier mentioned that i have been part of a lot of different hiv films right from the beginning um so hiv has been uh, something that i have Yeah, kind of engaged with in different ways as a research assistant, as a part of a film project, and all of those things. And 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 HIV is something, uh, you know, at that time it was, uh, you know, if anybody said they infected with HIV, that person is dead. I mean, you are a walking corpse. That was the, uh, you know, uh, that was what everybody thought and felt and. uh talked about right and also this larger thing saying doesn't happen to us it only happens to certain people and as we said viruses don't discriminate and 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 one of the things that i felt was that you know no this is everywhere and and for me uh in my other work uh, also this is something that is very very important because it is about sexual behavior and it is about sex education and when do we start uh, sex education in schools when do we and how do we um talk about prevention to young people and all of those things and and there is so much to go around this uh, and it was also an extension of my earlier work on reproductive health so it's all very very connected and in karnataka um, hiv is seen as a as a women's disease right uh, so it's 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 very different here so when uh, it kind of came all of this came together you know the 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 hiv activism around hiv and the and and the treatment and the medication all of this so it was just a natural process i i don't pick that oh i'm going to talk about these people or i'm going to work on these things so when i by the time i made this film it was just just a natural process of all my work earlier work coming together and 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 through these other work one keeps meeting people from different communities and start engaging with them then you, you know you know what's going on so we have another question from uh, rama she says uh, have you perceived any change in attitude towards those uh, who live with hiv since you made the film uh it's interesting because um you know 
a lot of it is the same. One of the things that has happened in the last uh, couple of years is that we don't talk about HIV anymore. Uh, in terms of the state, uh, we have actually dealt with it. Uh, we don't have many cases. Our numbers have come down. And so no one talks about it. There are no pro not as many programs as we had, we had 10, say, 15 years ago. And uh, But that doesn't mean the virus is gone. You have to understand that there is no cure. There is no vaccine for HIV. There are medicines which uh, protects you, which ca you can lead a healthy life if you are taking those medicines and you're taking all your nutritional supplements and all of that, you can continue to live. And I have seen, I mean, Chandrika was in the film and there's a whole bunch of women. They're all still there. And uh, and their children who were born with HIV, they are now young adults and they're having other issues. And we don't talk about HIV anymore. And uh, to a lot, to, um, uh, to a great extent, now the ARTs are being given freely in government hospitals, you, it becomes between you and the uh, health center that you go to and get your medication. So there is not much of a social uh, you know, support group and all of that that we had 20 years ago. So it's all going in a way a bit underground. And amongst young people, there is a rise in HIV infection. If you work with the groups, you know that these numbers are going. Mm, going up, but there isn't uh, a lot that is being done now. And with COVID, a lot of the people who are infected with HIV who are not, uh, who are from lower income uh, groups have really suffered because they do get their a ART medicine, but they don't get other things. Like they need a lot of supplementary drugs. Uh, if they don't have their livelihood, they can't afford to take those. And then they, and, and there has been deaths as well so um so in a way it's very again it's become silent and invisible but it is there people are getting infected uh, as we speak so uh, that question kind of segues beautifully into another question from siddharth he says would you like to comment on the hiv on hiv act uh, activism and access to uh, life-saving medicines in india today Oh yeah, the um, you get you get the third second line medication, third line medication, and all of that now. Third line medication is very very expensive. I don't know the current uh, uh, market rate, but uh, last year I knew that it was around twenty one thousand per month. There are few people who have gone on to this third line third line medication, uh, but apart apart from that. Um, I don't think people are living that long uh, who are then saying that. We need this, this, this. A lot of people pass away from opportunistic infections, from other diseases like tuberculosis or pneumonia. Uh, but we do see a lot of women surviving. I mean, that's always a question that intrigued me, like how do women live so much longer than men um, with HIV? Uh, so yeah, and in terms of activism, there is no money, there's no funding now. So a lot of the HIV groups are struggling uh, it is very, very hard for them to survive uh, and work. And uh, with COVID, it's even worse because their immunity is compromised to begin with and how much work they can do. And a lot of this work is, uh, when you talk about activism, is also about support group. It's supporting each other. So a lot of them actually work on going door to door, talking to people, taking them to hospitals or, you know, looking after their children. There have been a lot of foster care that has happened, uh, you know, amongst the HIV uh, families, infected families. So, um, you know, all of that needs physical contact. Right now, nobody is meeting anybody. I know people do phone counseling and all of that, but I actually don't know in, today what, what is going on in, on the ground. You know, I need to find out. But I do hear from people calling me and saying they are in, in, in distress. Thank you, Jayashree. Uh, Indu says, I mean, she uh, congratulates you on making a beautiful film, which is scarily prescient in the current times. And she says, referring to Lekar, how do you see the corporate sector coming in to fill the vacuum in the crisis that we're all in right now with COVID? Hmm. Um, I 
see the corporate sector i i really don't know i i find it very uh, difficult to understand what's going on in india right now because the the there are pharmaceutical producing capability here and we have all these companies but we are having this you know acute shortage of the you know the vaccine and we still don't have the transfer of technology from say pfizer or moderna or any of these things it is very very clear what lekar talks about is that it is now available in the western world everybody is getting it right the other thing that lekar talks about and we have also gone through earlier on uh, here is clinical trials for all of these things you need to do clinical trials and these big pharmaceutical companies always looked at third world countries for clinical trials and you know and and um, and you can come easily into india to any any slum and start launch a you know clinical trial without even saying that it's clinical trial it has happened and, and we we did a short film on uh, this something called the iu346 which is an uh, oral contraceptive pill when it was tried in uh, a couple of slums in bombay and pune i mean there were no protocols and women were dying um, so and this is this is happening all over this has happened all over there been a lot of people trying to talk about it we were supposed to have brought in some regulations around clinical trials um, so but you can see in with the covid vaccine the clinical trials happened in say in the us right and now they are trying on their children for the you know covid vaccine for kids and all of that they are doing it very fast because they also know a lot more than before the other drugs right? and so it's always the clinical trials are always a very tricky murky uh, areas and they would do it in third world countries also cheaper to do it in these places uh, so even now the pfizer uh, vaccine they are saying no they don't want that uh, indemnity clause you know they don't want anything goes wrong they don't want to be questioned about that so these these are things that have always played and these global pharmaceutical companies are very very powerful and they you know control the governments so we'll have to see how you know it's going to pan out now it's very clear you know one thing that covid has done is that these are no longer something that is difficult ideas these are very normal ideas that it, it is going to affect all of us it is affecting all of us so. yes indeed mm -hmm. so urvashi has a question she says she asks assuming that this information and this film or the ideas explored in the film would go to schools um about sex education and about the kind of uh, struggles that people face with respect to access to medicines what would you suggest um what would you suggest the changes that could be implemented in the way that we learn about these things in sort of educational settings like schools or universities yeah well, one major thing that we really need is to have open discussions about without fear and without uh, creating uh, you know uh, uh, any kind of disturbance in young minds uh, to talk about uh, sexual health that is one thing and how to take care of yourself and how do you take care of others and the other thing is empathy and prejudice i mean these are the two things right prejudice is completely uh, dictating everything now so and it was there it is then it is now too so in educational setting especially with young people uh, you have a great opportunity to actually talk about these ideas and to talk about you know discrimination how do you overcome discrimination and and your own fears and and in that sense you can use use these kind of films as a tool to talk about tackle those issues as well and not just about and about medicine or, or or contracting the virus which is why we never ask anybody in the film how did you get this how did you get infected that's not a question that i am interested in at all uh, it is like you got it and how are we going to manage it how can we prevent from getting getting that infection you know so those are the the two ideas that go parallelly so and these are something that you have to engage with young people in schools and colleges and and therefore you know they can actually make up their own minds and then have a healthy life so jeshu that leads me to a question that was on my mind about uh, act one of the exhibits that is being shown as a part of contagion which is fluid dialogues uh, for those 
in our audience who don't know what the exhibit is about, Fluid Dialogues is basically a video piece which juxtaposes microscopic footage of blood along with uh, audio interviews of people who live with infectious diseases, especially like um, HIV. And it attempts to sort of destigmatize and uh, make more personal the experiences of this, uh, the people who live with infectious diseases. So Jeshri, um, we know that you collaborated with Basse on producing this exhibit and that some of the interviews that were taken as a part of the film were used in this exhibit. So can you tell us a little bit about the collaboration and what that was like and why you chose the interviews that you did to become a part of the exhibit? Um, so with Buzz um, contacted me. He he's, he wanted to do something with the blood, right? And viruses, HIV virus, attacks your blood system. So, um, so and it's invisible. It's in your body, inside your body. You can't really make out. I mean, even today, you can't make out who's infected with HIV and who's not. You know. Um, so we don't have those kind of uh, early HIV uh, manifestation of skin cancer, which we saw in the Caucasian population or in, in what they call slim disease in, in the African continent where people just lost weight and then they perished. In India, you don't see either of these things. You know, you look really healthy and, and you may lose some weight, but not really. And, and there aren't any other manifestation, uh, but we are seeing the cancer in the children, children who have survived HIV for a longer time. We see, we are seeing that, you know, after 20 years, but all in all, you can't really make out who you so when he, he talked about, he wanted to see the inside the body, the, the, the blood, and, and, and to create some kind of a visual you know, um, interpretation of what people are going through, uh, it kind of struck, uh, you know, it was an interesting idea. And also blood is universal, it's everywhere, no borders, no, you know, it's the same thing with the virus as well. So then we constructed this narrative where, you know, he, he also did a lot of interviews with people at present living with HIV in Europe, uh, and and uh, who've lived longer with HIV in Europe. And then he wanted to kind of mix those with the voices from my film, which was shot again globally 15 years ago. So in a way, it kind of builds a narrative. And then the picture that you get at the end of it is that, you know, it's not much has changed. You know, it's the it's it's it's, it's all of the things, ideas that we've discussed about it comes to. Um, and, and, and this, this virus is doing something in your body and, and that affects the whole world and how you live your life and how do you look at life, yeah. Indy, thank you so much, uh, Jayashree, for um, making this remarkable, sensitive and extremely uh, timely film. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure showing it at Contagion and to hear you and Vikram speak about it in the discussion and to hear you answer all our questions today as well. So thank you so much for uh, being a part of our exhibition season. And thank you to everyone who joined us today evening. Uh, like I said, when, before we started this discussion, in case you miss watching the film, uh, please do check out our exhibition website. We have uh, five other films that we're showing as a part of the exhibition season and they will be live until the 13th of June. And uh, the recording of Jayashri and Vikram's discussion is also available on our YouTube channel, along with the recording of several other programs like our public lecture series. So please do um, take a look at our YouTube channel and share this with people who might have not, who might have missed this session. Uh, please do uh, fill out the feedback form. Uh, we would love to know what worked well in this experience for you and what we could do better going forward. Um, and do check out the exhibit that uh, Jeshi worked on along with Basse, which is Fluid Dialogues. Um, at 6.30 p.m. today, we have a lecture by Girish Sahane on the art of pandemics. So we hope to see many of you there. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jeshi. Thank and you. Have a restful Sunday. Thank you. Take care. Yeah.